Green's functions and integral equations, or PDs, and singularities. So a gravitational field of a point mass, like the Earth in the grand scheme of things, is harmless because the Earth is extended. So if I stand on the surface of the Earth, I don't fall into the singularity that would have existed at the center of the Earth if I just use Newton's law of gravity. We might be more concerned about the electric field of a point charge in Maxwell's theory. It looks like there's a problem that Coulomb force is infinite at the location of the charge. But actually, in quantum electrodynamics, this is not much of a problem. At the center of a black hole, Einstein's theory is known to break down because the curvature becomes unbounded. So at the center of the black hole, not the event horizon, the center, it could be some problem. And this is not really understood how to deal with, unlike these two problems. So here we're going to mostly focus on these two and then maybe comment on something like this at the end. So I mean special points when I say singularity. Special point of a vector field. In Fuchsian ODs, singularity means the coefficient of the highest order derivative vanishes. This could be related to this, but it's not necessarily what I'm talking about here. So what am I talking about? Let's look at the electric potential of a conductor, perfect conductor, placed in a uniform electric field. So the field looks like this at infinity, at plus and minus infinity. And the potential of this vector field is a solution of the Laplace equation. So you might say this is a completely charge-free region. There's nothing funny going on with singularities. But if you look inside, you see that the arrows appear to emanate from here, and it's, they appear to go into some point here. It looks like there are charges inside, even though for sure there were no charges outside. It's even more obvious if you draw the equipotential lines, the level sets of potential energy, the lines along which you don't need to use work to pull a test charge. And it looks even more like here there's something special happening, like a point charge. But we didn't really consider point charge to start with. So where's this coming from? Similarly, if you view this as a line vortex in fluid dynamics, that would be in Swedish, that's virvel for whirlwind. So it's appropriate to show this picture. So there's also singularity, but we know that there's no infinite anything in the middle of this tornado. There's a special point in the sense of a vector field. You probably also heard of divergences in physics. It's well known that the quantum field theory used in particle physics, the photon of electrons, has a problem of infinities. Nowadays, it's not really thought of as a problem per se, but this is what we usually mean by divergence. This is quantum physics. Let's just talk about classical divergences for now. So in Newton's theory of gravity, there's certainly a divergence at r equals zero of the Newton force. The Coulomb force looks like it has a singularity at the location of point charge, as I said before. Rutherford scattering of alpha particles off of a gold foil has an infrared singularity. And there's a resonance singularity if you have some eigenfrequency that corresponds to the frequency you're shaking something at. It can be uncontrollable resonances. As discussed, for example, in Goldstein's book, Classical Mechanics. Here's an even more basic question. If you have a point load, you hang something on a beam at a point x. We model that by a point load delta x as in the Dirac delta function. So you think of these five examples. Are they physical and should we worry? Well, in the case of the Dirac, you might say, well, this is obviously not a problem because we have optimized our calculation by making this force infinitely well localized. Whereas in reality, of course, there's some thickness to all this stuff here. You might say, this has nothing to do with how Dirac thought about it and he was doing quantum mechanics and so on. But actually, it's quite possible that he first read about it from Heavey's side. Dirac was an engineering student in Bristol, England. He was not the first to invent it, according to Dirac's biography. So what are we actually trying to do here? So let's look at an ODE. This is a very simple ODE. We're trying to find the function f. And we're saying second derivative of f plus f equals some right-hand side g. What's an ODE called that has a right-hand side? Inhomogeneous. The reason I made this x explicit is I'm saying the right-hand side has no f in it, and f is the function we're trying to find. So let's say we knew how to solve the homogeneous equation where the g was zero. How do we solve the inhomogeneous equation from that? That would be like solving the Laplace equation without charges and then adding charges. So we're going to do exactly that. We're going to use linearity of this differential operator here on the left to build up a solution by elementary point sources that are delta functions. So here's my delta function. It's infinite at zero and zero elsewhere. So of course, it's not really a function in the strict sense of the word. Mathematicians sometimes call it distribution. But for us, all we need to know is that integral of delta x dx is defined to be 1. You can approximate it by, for example, by a bell curve that's very narrow. What does this have to do with Green's functions? So the point of a Green's function is that it can have a kink like this. Differentiate it once, you get a step function named by Heavey's side, Dirac's teacher. If you differentiate it again, you get a delta function. This derivative is discontinuous. Here the function itself is discontinuous. And here you actually get a delta function. Now, it's not drawn to infinity because it has a strength. We integrate it to 1, so if I multiply delta by 2, it would integrate to 2. How does this help us solve this simple ODE? Well, write an equation for the Green's function. So right, the left-hand side looks just like the left-hand side here. But remember, the Green's function depends on two variables. First, the one we want to have, x, and then the location of the point charge, x0. 
which here will be zero. So now you try to solve this equation for a function of two variables, the Green's function. This gives a solution of the inhomogeneous equation as a convolution of the Green's function g with the right-hand side little g. Let me just make a historical remark that's actually useful for the future. This is also known as Fredholm theory in mathematics after Ivar Fredholm. I often lectured in Fredholm's lecture hall in Stockholm. So what are we doing? More generally, this is a differential operator L on F gives us a right-hand side G. Define Green's function by this equation. You get the solution from convolution, as we just said. Now this could be in three dimensions or whatever. This is my bold fizz here. How do we check this? Act with this operator on F. This operator is defined to act on the first argument. So when you do that, you just get this delta function by definition of this equation. And by definition of the delta function, in three dimensions, we integrate this, you get g. Sometimes we put a d3r here. Maybe I should have done that. If g vanishes at infinity, we get this. There can be extra terms that have to do with boundary conditions. But in this simple context, we see that defining g like this gives us a solution of the inhomogeneous equation like this. Let's take an example. So the Laplace equation, I gave the example of axial symmetry earlier. Let's do an even simpler example of spherical symmetry. Let's assume in three dimensions that f is just a function of r, and we're trying to solve the Laplace equation. The only thing that's left is the radial derivative of f, and I'll work in d dimensions, that little d could be 3 in the case of interest. This is easy to see that now this must be constant. Effectively, this is a one-variable equation. We can just flip over r to the other side, and we see that f is given by the simple constant times r to the 2 minus d, as long as d is greater than 2. Otherwise, we would have some problem here in d equals 2. For d equals 3, we find that f is just some constant over r. So is this right? This looks kind of simple. Is this a solution of the Laplace equation in spherical symmetry in three dimensions? Laplace equation follows from Maxwell's equation in the absence of external charges. So that describes a static electric field. The electric field means if you take a test particle, well not this particle, another particle, it gets a force like this. And this force is the Coulomb force. And if you integrate the Coulomb force over some distance, you move this test particle, for example, from infinity to this position, then you pay this much energy or work if you use the Coulomb formula, you get this integral. And the electric potential is just defined as this work divided by the test charge in Coulomb. So you get this kq over r, where k is the Coulomb constant, q is the amount of charge, and r is the radius between the source charge and this test charge. Does this work then? Yes, this fits. But what really happened at the origin now? Just like the Coulomb force is infinite at r equals zero, this electric potential is also infinite at r equals zero. Let's try to cut out a small ball right around this point charge. Let's integrate over this small ball of radius epsilon of this nabla square C of R against, meaning multiply with, an arbitrary test function. So I'm going to make up some you know, reasonably smooth function here that I'm just going to put here and discover a delta function in here. As long as this ball is small enough, we can approximate the value of this smooth function by its value at the origin. And then we can use a familiar theorem from vector analysis. If we're a little bit careful about the minus sign, we get this where I use that 1 over r squared here for the hollow sphere with radius epsilon just gives this times the area of the sphere. So you see that the 1 over r squared here cancels the epsilon squared. What does this mean? You're doing something here and you get back h of 0 times one constant. So that means that there was a delta function in here. In other words, we can think of this object as given a delta function. So the Green's function of the Laplace equation is apparently 1 over r. But as we know, it's really a function of two variables, so it's 1 over the distance. But we could just say Green's function of r2 equals 0 is 1 over r times some constant. With this function f that we already computed here, we accidentally came upon g. We were not really saying what was going on at the origin. And now we're admitting that at the origin is sitting the point charge. So physically, you could have already guessed this. But now we see that just solving the Laplace equation outside a small ball we can actually learn something about the Green's function of the Laplace equation, including the point charge, the delta function at the origin. To mathematicians, this is a little worrying. The simplest possible example should be two dimensions. We saw that the calculation I did earlier doesn't work there, but it's a simple extension of it works. By the way, one dimension is almost trivial, but it does have interest in physical interpretation in terms of the heat equation. I won't talk more about that right now. The space where you cut out this small disk has different topology than the plane. It's the punctured plane. And actually, also in higher dimensions, when you cut out the small ball at the origin, it's not really the same space you're working on anymore. In mathematical terms, this hole is detectable by a lasso. So if I lasso around this hole and I pull on the lasso, I detect that there's a hole. And that technique is called homotopy. So the fundamental group pi is discussed on this Wikipedia page. And solving the Laplace equation in two dimensions is discussed in Polchinski's String Theory book as one of the first exercises. So if you're interested in this stuff, uh, please go ahead and read more. But right now, let's keep going and look at another physical example, the wave equation in three dimensions, as derived probably by Euler. There's a very nice reference for P Fitzpatrick's uh, three lectures. The Green's function is pretty much what we already had for the Laplace equation, 
except there's a delta function on top. There's some combination of the position and a position at the point source and the time and the time of the point source. What does that mean? Well, because of the delta function, this whole thing is only non-zero if this holds, which is like saying there's a certain time that takes to come from R to R prime or conversely. So we have a wave that starts at the origin and goes out radially. It's a closer relationship to sturm liouville theory, where we can look at different boundary conditions. What we do is we expand in orthogonal eigenfunctions. So in the case of the Laplace equation, for example, I make an ansatz that I have an eigenfunction xi. If I had a vector index or a space-time index, I could have put some constant in front of it. But basically, this is what I'm trying to solve. I just invert the eigenvalue and expand in eigenfunctions, and it's easy to check that it's, as long as you can exchange order of integration and summation, this will certainly solve that equation. And if you had a more general sturm liouville equation with a lambda, as something's called, that would appear also as a shift down here. So this is a pretty general theory for computing Green's functions if you have a set of eigenfunctions of some differential operator. Freedom theory, again, gives interesting statements about this. The freedom kernel K that I mentioned before, you can now define a Riemann zeta function with a determinant with this s. I won't get into this here, but I think it's useful to have heard that if you can expand in eigenfunctions, there's a natural construction of, of a Riemann zeta function for any specific differential operator. In physics, we often do analytic continuation. So the Laplace and wave equation that we just talked about can be related by a wick rotation to imaginary time. This keeps the algebraic structure, if you want, of the original differential equation, but it changes the analytic structure. For example, if the heat equation becomes the Schrodinger equation by a wick rotation, and we know that the heat equation is not really reversible. If you start with a sharp edge, it gets smoothed out in time, whereas Schrodinger you can evolve back and forth. In quantum field theory, there's a special boundary condition called Feynman I epsilon, which means that if you have some poles on the real axis, you shift them by an I epsilon off of the real axis so that you can wick rotate. Because wick rotation means taking this axis here and pulling it up here, then you're allowed to do that if these poles are not in the way, so to speak. So this is what's called the Feynman boundary condition. And it's a little bit different from the solution of the wave equation we talked about earlier, which is called the retarded boundary condition. There's an interesting relationship between them, and that's discussed on this page. And all this is very relevant for scattering theory, where you start by throwing something in and you see what comes out, as in particle physics. And uh, this is not really the main part of this video, but if you're interested, bear with me. The differential cross-section is given in terms of the charges, kinetic energy, and the scattering angle of theta. It's discussed nicely in Sakurai. This is a classical limit of a quantum mechanical cross-section. You see there's an infrared divergence here, as I discussed earlier. There are other cross-sections that have similar issues, but these are all classical cross-sections. What about quantum? In Sakurai, it's discussed that if you take a wave packet, take a localized uh, disturbance, this could represent the wave function of a particle. Right? In the Heisenberg picture, there'll be some evolving operator describing this. So it has wave vector k, or momentum k, if p is h bar k. So this comes in and scatters. Then the scattering region sends out a spherical wave. So you see this is related to what we were talking about before. And there's a Born approximation, Max Born, which says that you can think of the wave function as being some spherical wave emanating from the origin. And the differential cross-section is just the absolute value squared of the amplitude. So the scattering potential V is only non-zero in this scattering region. And that gives you a scattering amplitude, which gives you the measurable differential cross-section. How many particles come out per solid angle? You can repeat the strategy of the Born approximation. So you come in here, you scatter, free propagation, you scatter, free propagation. So this is an infrared regularization of your infinite reach scattering potential that cures your long distance singularity. It doesn't really cure it because once you take it away, then you're back. But you can compute in this framework, and you can learn things, and then you can try to take a limit once you understood. And the general framework for, for repeating this Born approximation is the Lippmann-Schwinger equation. This equation looks completely useless when you first see it, because you need to know the Green's function, you need to know the scattering potential, you need to know the thing you wanted to know. That seems to be circular, that you have the thing appears here and here, but in fact, that is the point of integral equations, like Fredholm. They do iterative solutions, you make some very simple approximation here, like we did in the Born approximation, and you iterate it. So that once you have a solution, you put it in here, and you try to find a new solution, you put it in here, and that corresponds to this repetitive scattering. Ultimately, this leads you to Feynman diagram. Feynman diagram means something comes in and there's scattering happening and then it propagates freely and it scatters and it propagates freely and so on. This is the differential operator of the wave equation and there's a mass term. So this is some scalar field that satisfies this equation. Its Green's function is like this where we included the Feynman I epsilon. And now my x here without the bold face refers to space and time. So this is a four vector. You do a 4D Fourier transform of this. That just means effectively flipping this down here, four momentum squared, p squared. I'm going to consider massless scattering, so just set m to zero. We can suppress the epsilon, what we should ultimately remember is there. And then you can do this convolution of these different propagators, these different inverse Green's functions that appear down here. 
So for example, the first one would be one over P squared. The one associated with this propagator is one over L squared. That's this one. You can actually perform this explicitly in terms of hypergeometric functions that I discussed in a different video. This is Lelash transcendent. It generates polylogarithms. And this is a nice way to try to understand this kind of massless 4.1 loop diagram in scalar field theory. What about string theory? String theory is supposed to reproduce quantum field theory at long distance. So this is string theory amplitude. You take an open string, splits into two open strings, and rejoin up here. The amplitude can be written in terms of the Dedekind eta function and the Jacobi theta function. Z is this so-called partition function, and this is the amplitude. So this is the annulus amplitude in open strings in 10 dimensions. So the simplest case you can consider in superstring theory. My point here is going to be that if you have a p-dimensional surface that this open string attaches to, it's called a d-brain, when L goes to infinity, you get this simple thing left, you can perform this integral, and it gives you the Green's function where this is just what we had before. The Green's function of the Laplace equation is r to the 2 minus d. Even though we think of this as a wave equation type thing, this is more like a Laplace equation after Wick rotation. Actually, the integral representation of the Green's function of the Laplace as a theta function generalizes to compact cases by automorphic forms. So this is a very interesting topic in mathematics, the Debrain potential, open closed duality, Let's discuss further in Polchinski chapter 10 and 13. Another name for these things is heat kernel method. The theta function is a heat kernel, which in lippmann schwinger is called a propagator. What that means is that when I flip time going from here to here, correspond to closed string, this circle here, going that way. There's no analog of this for point particles, so this is a new feature in string theory that you can have time going like this, a time going like that, and you have a similar mathematical expression that gives you two different interpretations. And just for something that's current research, Wick rotation string theory is not completely worked out. Witten has a very nice paper on that, but one question is classical closed strings can form cusps before Wick rotation. In the Lorentzian signature, they form cusps that could emit directed gravitational waves that could in principle be detected. 